Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Kahn. I am the Provost and Vice President Academic here at Trent. As we gather here tonight, and what a lovely evening it is, um, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga Ashinabek. We offer our gratitude to the First Nations for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. On behalf of Trent University, it is my honor to welcome you to the annual Elaine Stavro Distinguished Visiting Scholar in Theory, Politics, and Gender Lecture. I've been at Trent for just, an, just over two years now, so this is actually my first in-person <laughs> lecture. So really, it's a privilege to be here. At Trent, we value community engagement, working with our community par partners in sharing knowledge, sharing perspectives through faculty and student research, developing and delivering relevant curriculum, and providing impactful experiential learning opportunities to our students. Tonight is all thanks to Elaine Stavro and her dedication to fostering critical dialogue in cultural studies and politics. Dr. Stavro received her PhD in political theory from the University of Toronto. She joined Trent in 1990 after teaching at universities in England and at Queen's University in Kingston. A distinguished scholar with numerous books and journal publications, her research has centered mainly on the field of feminist theory. While at Trent, Dr. Stavro has served as director of the graduate program in theory, culture, and politics. She is the acting chair for political studies and is a member of the graduate faculty in the Frost Center. Established in 2011, the Elaine Stavro Distinguished Visiting Scholar in Theory, Politics, and Gender Studies was created to enhance Trent's outstanding reputation for interdisciplinary research. And second, to introduce students and community members to leading speakers in humanities and social sciences. On behalf of Trent University, it is our pleasure to have this lecture here tonight and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Elaine Stavro, um, thank Dr. Elaine Stavro for her dedication and the legacy she has left here at Trent. Elaine, I invite you to the floor to say a few words. Thank you, Michael. In these dark times, underfunding of Ontario universities is proceeding apace and the university is increasingly forced to seek private funding to make up the shortfall. This has meant pursuing tactics of fundraising and marketing. While some people have favored having their names cemented in bricks and mortar or associated with scientific life-saving projects, I wanted to help mitigate that part of the university that is often neglected, research in the humanities and social sciences. As our teaching complement has continually been eroded and funding for non-scientific or impractical research gets more difficult, I hope in a small way to ease this crisis by bringing a distinguished scholar to Trent to share their research. I remember being struck by the French educational system. Members of the community sat and listened attentively to the public lectures of Roland Barthes, Michel Foucault, Lévi Strauss, Jacques Derrida. Peterborough is not Paris, but <laughs> the insights of an and the insights of an intellectual in Anglo-American culture are not valued as they are in Europe. In fact, the intellectual is often spurned for producing abstract, idiosyncratic, and useful no useless knowledge, or alternatively for believing they capture the true and just for all. Such rhetoric should be avoided. One must prize open a place for the public intellectual. Bonnie Honig's work is a thoughtful intervention on contemporary problems. She manages to bring canonical political theory, feminist thinking, psychoanalysis, and discourse analysis to bear on political problems. As I've personally been a member of both the schools of humanities and social sciences at Trent, I've been struck by the misconceptions that are form our perceptions of each other. The humanities faculty imagine the social scientists spend their time engaged in empirical work to disclose the real world, measuring happiness, striving to find the gain gene, gain gene or establishing cause and effect chains to predict future incomes, outcomes. The social scientists, for their part, imagine the humanities produce knowledge that is abstract, symbolic, possibly creative, but free-floating ideas, in no way contributing to improving the human condition or human understanding. 
how we make sense of the world we live in is not going to be achieved by the analysis of stro social structures alone. Efforts to explore the symbolic and technologized worlds of subjectivity and the specificity of events will be furthered by exchange within with philosophers, historians, cultural and literary theorists. In our dark times, where impact and metrics and practicality measure research accomplishments and worth, we should take heed and not buy into calls for immediate, immediate relevance. The intent, of this, the intent of this endowed lectureship is to foster conversations and collaboration between the humanities and the social sciences, providing knowledge that is meaningful, furthering understanding, and encouraging thoughtfulness. Bonnie Honick's work is exemplary. Her theoretical interventions that appreciate the symbolic nature of political knowing and its historical situatedness go some distance to connect these often separate and warring approaches to knowing. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for those kind words and those perspectives on the humanities and social science. Your provost listened very carefully. <laughs> Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nanine Changfoot, Professor of Political Science at Trent University, to introduce our guest speaker. Nadine. Thank you, Provost Michael. It is my honor to welcome and welcome back and introduce tonight's distinguished and multiple award-winning scholar of the highest acclaim, Dr. Bonnie Honig, Nancy Duke Lewis Professor of Modern Culture and Media and Political Science at Brown University. Professor Honig's soaring mind and prolific writing labor has led and continues to lead us as critically minded students, researchers, and citizens to understand the complexity of politi politics and power in the United States and beyond its borders through film. I'll draw your attention to her bo books, Democracy and the Foreigner, as well as Politics Theory and Film, and in her reference to gaslighting of democratic institutions and the ongoing activism against this by feminist criticism and activism. Uh, and refusals in her book, Shell Shocked, Feminist Criticism After Trump. She does this through her brilliance in thinking with and through black feminist and critical theorists from both the canon of political theory and those who occupy an uneasy relationship alongside it, as well as, in her words, opponent political theorists. She has written of her own agonistic practice. It is a key commitment of agonism that we make our opponents' positions the best they can be, the opposite of a straw man, and then see how engaging with their positions shapes our own. We are welcoming Professor Honig to Peterborough Ngojiwanong at a time during which Canada's political landscape is rapidly changing. But for political theorists, the political landscape is always rapidly changing and in crisis. <laughs> the new leader of one of our major political parties signals this change, as does the Ontario government's recent announcements of healthcare privatization and policies which position elders as movable things, not whole people, to fit public institutions and not the other way around, meaning that public institutions should be made fit and fitting with good resources for citizens. It doesn't seem long ago when center progressive Canadian commentators uh, were reassuring citizens that the undoing of the demos um, was largely contained to south of the 49th parallel. Uh, this position no longer holds indeed if it ever did or could. In response to, in her own words, democracy in disrepair, Professor Honig refers to the arc of refusal in her 2021 book, A Feminist Theory of Refusal. Each of us here are witnessing and or participating 
in such an arc. This arc's trajectory is moving toward a horizon, a horizon comprising complexity and entanglement of indigenous resurgence, black joy, crip desire, queering life, getting by, precarity, slow death, bare life, maiming, disabling, and genocide. This complexity is materialized, we know, in face of and because of state and capitalism's ever new intensities of privatization and re extraction, which of course reflect or materialize interlocking multiple crises. These are crises of income inequality, housing, gender violence, opioids, mental health, intractabilities of systemic discrimination, food, climate, mass extinction, and more. Professor Honig's book, Public Things, Democracy in Disrepair, remains more relevant than ever since its 2017 emergence. The role of specific public things and how concerted action produces and generates their sustainability um, and how uh, or destroys and eliminates imagination of them are significant. Now more than ever, as citizens, deliberation over public things is needed to really breathe life into areas where public things are being snatched and diminished at an alarming speed. I see Professor Honig's exploration of refusals as useful. Useful in one, of, in one of her senses and of a critical disposition of stealing back from neoliberal forces what such forces take away. First, the slowing down of time. Second, deliberation for agonistic strategies which involve both refuge and recovery of agency from and within violence. And third, engagement for democracy's potentialities. On that note, please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Bonnie Honig as she lectures on Toward a Democratic Theory of Contagion. So Bab and Joy setting me up with this in this unnecessary but very necessary way is showing why he's the first I'll thank this evening for the hospitality extended to me before my visit and during my visit, also to Provost Michael Kahn and to Elaine Stavro. Oh, I lost you for a second. There you are. Um, for uh, just really an incredible hospital. I've been here a day, I feel like I've been here a week in the best sense, like I've just been soaking up the beautiful weather that we've been so lucky to have and the glorious architecture in this beautiful room and the great minds and I've had some conversations already, I look forward to more. And uh, I just wanna thank everyone, thank you for being here. <clears throat> uh, so you see the title, you've heard a little bit about my work, hyperbolically. Um, thank you, I forgot to thank Nadine for that glorious introduction, which felt so awkward, so I forgot, awkward to me, beautiful for you. Um, I, so uh, thank you very much for that as well. Uh, the paper that I'm gonna present tonight looks at three depictions of contagion in political theory, in drama and film through the lens of speech act theory, uh, which is to say from the perspective of what's called performativity. Um, and don't worry, because every odd term I'm gonna talk about. So, uh, but it's called performativity. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with that word, strange word, performativity, performatives originally meant a certain kind of speech act or utterance. Uh, that inaugurates or does things, like I promise I will give this to you. Inaugurates a relationality between us, it doesn't describe anything, and this is a podium, is by contrast a constative utterance, it describes something that's in the world. I didn't bring it into being by saying this is a podium, I've just described what was already in existence. 
So constatives are statements that describe, performatives are statements that do. Perhaps the best known examples of performatives are promising and forgiveness. These are speech acts that are theorized by J.L. Austin in his canonical work, How to Do Things with Words. In Austin, it is said, mostly by his critics, that speech acts postulate or install a sovereign subject, an I, whose word can be his bond, as in I promise. The reason that counts for you is presumably because you have some faith in me. But in the work of Hannah Arendt, especially the human condition, promising and forgiveness are performatives. They bring something new into being, but not because they're attached to a sovereign I. In fact, there are kinds of political action that are contingent and uncontrollable, extraordinary, unexpected, quintessentially political speech acts. They don't postulate a subject who governs the scene with his intentions. They birth the self um, and exceed the control or intention of any one speaker. In a political uh, event, someone might promise something and everyone might hear it a certain way and suddenly you're bound to something you didn't intend but you're still bound, Arendt would say. Inaugural speech acts leave us vulnerable to misconstrual and misunderstanding, also to corruption, and so on. In addition to promising and forgiveness, Austin frequently recurs to the I do of the straight wedding, words that perform something. Uh, it's its own special kind of promise. Um, and that, too, the I do, is an example, Austin says, of performativity. Focused on this one, the I do, and on the harm done by it to the sexually minoritized, Eve Sedgwick proposed in 1993 that we think of some performatives as deformatives. That's her term. Characterized by Sedgwick as, quote, uniquely contagious, Deformatives are a specific kind of performative speech act. They include sentences like, I dare you. You're not dared until I say it, so I've brought something into being. As in, I dare you to climb that tree, punch that guy, etc. But they also include shame on you, a performative that dispenses entirely with that I. Unlike I dare you, shame on you has no I. Indeed, it alibis the I that says it by postulating as its subject a community with standards. All deformatives, that is to say those both with and without the I, are performatives that aim to shame. That's Sedgwick's idea, that some performatives aim to shame, or whose impact is shaming. They're speech acts that stigmatize, absorb, or isolate their targets, and they are, Sedgwick says, a formative experience of queerness. Now, Sedgwick doesn't develop the idea of deformativity in detail. I'm working with one article from 1993. She went on to publish many more books after that, um, but the term deformativity did not attract her attention, um, or did not continue to attract her attention. Uh, in order to discuss deformativity in detail and with particular attention to the role of contagion in democratic theory, I want to track the workings of deformativity through three examples of contagion. And in all three, as we'll see, there are concerns aired about pleasure and its contagion, and also its threat to societal projects of production and reproduction. So here are the three examples. The three examples, I, and by the way, all of that was a sort of dense version of the theory argument, and I'm going to air it out after I continue to summarize, so I'll revisit all those points. The three examples I'm going to look at tonight are the back eye, the fits, and John Rawls as a theory of justice. So first, in Euripides' play, The Back Eye, a fifth century tragedy, Cadmus, the former king, tries to repartition the women of Thebes to their households after they've gone off on a queer adventure in refusal, which the women then bring back to the city, hoping it might catch on. In a 2015 second example, a film about contagion called The Fits, a young black girl, a figure of queer quiet, experiences the fits and is then reabsorbed into loud community where she may be included or she may be drowned out. Depends how we read it. The third example is Rawls's canonical political theory text, A Theory of Justice, 
where Rawls asks what to do towards the end of the book, page 430 something, uh, Rawls asks what to do about an unaccountable pleasure seeker who lives quietly in justice as fairness, the name of his regime. Rawls argues for tolerance for this oddball, but the language of, that Rawls uses in discussing this case is the language of quarantine, as we shall see. So he performs a kind of deformative sequestration. So why these three? It's an odd assemblage. But I've discussed all of these texts before and all of these examples. Rawls in my first book, which came out in 1993, and the back eye and the fits in my most recent one, A Feminist Theory of Refusal, which Nadine just mentioned. I've thus far treated all of these examples as examples of refusal, but under pressure of recent events, I've come to realize that all three are also about contagion, and that in all three, deformatives respond to fears that are incited by that, by the contagion. Okay. So let me elaborate a little bit on what I've already said, and then I'm going to go into each of the examples in some uh, detail. And I know I'm skipping that. Okay. So, uh, so in Political Theory and the Displacement of Politics, a book I wrote in 1993, I argued that Hannah Arendt's account of action as word and deed was best understood as a speech act in J.L. Austin's sense. Except his were ordinary, he thinks promising and forgiving are part of just ordinary language philosophy, which they are, um, and hers are extraordinary. For her, it's completely extraordinary that people would promise and forgive each other in the scene of political exchange. Uh, moreover, Arendt's accounts of founding and augmentation and amendment constitutional practices in a US context were magnetic. They draw others in to act in concert. That's her key term, action in concert someone promises, it magnetizes others to join, um, to join in the joy of world making. So that's what I was doing. In the same year, 1993, unbeknownst to me at the time, queer theorist Eve Sedgwick published an essay on queer performativity in which she gave a reading of Austin, and she characterized shame as a performative speech act that also had magnetic powers. She called shame uniquely contagious, as I mentioned, and what she meant was that spectators to a shaming incident will blush right along with the target or be drawn in to join the bully and laugh along with him. Her point, I take it, was that no one stays neutral in the scene of shame, which is a constitutive experience of queerness, the experience of finding out that others know you have a secret. Sometimes they know before you do and then the experience is really constitutive. In her 1993 reading of J.L. Austin, Sedgwick argued that this kind of Austinian performative, uniquely contagious and damaging, needed a name of its own, and she proposed deformative. She pointed out that the happy I do of the wedding ceremony, which she thought functioned as Austin's iconic example of performativity, does not only inaugurate a couple's life together, what could be more lovely than saying I do to each other, it also institutes the sovereign I. J. Hillis Miller pointed out in 2001 that the I in this case was masculine, the he takes the wife, she is taken. Stanley Cavell said in 2005 that even if Austin's speech acts do install an I, they also reach out to a you. I do is an outreach utterance too. But Eve Sedgwick, writing much earlier, went further. The performatives she wants to track, specifically the I do, harbor a deformative. There is in every I do a shame on you, she said, targeted at those remaindered by the straight wedding, 1993. This explains why sexually minoritized people are often ambivalent about attending straight weddings, Sedgwick suggested back then. The officiators I now pronounce you also pronounce their love unpronounceable. Attending to scenes of shaming rather than to those of marrying or christening, which are the more ritualized kind of utterances that most of Austin's readers select out uh, for attention, attending to scenes of shaming calls attention not just to the need for a performative theory of assembly, which is Judith Butler's term for protest gatherings and occupations that they argue are prefigurative, we need also, I would argue, an assembly theory of the performative. Performative shaming, which is to say deformativity, with its unique contagion, draws a crowd, 
It doesn't assume one and then go from there. It explains how one comes to be. But as with all performatives, the fact of a crowd is not enough. It needs to be worded somehow. Weddings and funerals tend to begin with the words, we are gathered here today. That performative utterance convenes. It doesn't prefigure. It turns a crowd into a gathering. Austin doesn't bring his prodigious powers of analysis to bear on we are gathered here today, but he does discuss I welcome you, which is not dissimilar, and which is, he says, half performative and half constitutive. Now, I'm not sure about that half and half, which divides a little too evenly, but we are gathered here today, that utterance definitely is a performative that masquerades as a constitutive. We are gathered, that's a description of a fact. It's descriptively true, and yet it's the saying of it, the we are gathered here today, that does the gathering. All those introductions were gathering us together for this event. We might think of we are gathered as a kind of super performative, the mother of all performatives, because whatever else they do, all performatives do this. They convene in a way. They convene something. And this idea would be central to an assembly theory of the performative. At a wedding or a funeral, when we hear the words we are gathered here today, we stop our private conversations with our plus one or attenuate our being with greed and kin in order to look around, see who's there, gathered now into a relationality that is more than mere proximity. Estranged relatives, childhood acquaintances, old neighbors, and most intriguing in such settings, total strangers, are gathered with us into assembly by dint of some spoken words, shared space, and intimacy or acquaintance with the couple or the corpse. As with all performatives, sometimes the specific words of gathering do not need to be said directly in order for the gathering to be convened. None of the introducers said we are gathered, but they all gathered us. Words, yes, have to be said, but not necessarily those. So in the case, for example, of Sedgwick's iconic deformative, even when the words we are gathered are not said, and the bully's I dare you is, a crowd is convened. It gathers to watch what will happen next in the scene of shame or to assist in it. Sedgwick's analysis, which as I say, though she does not, points to an assembly theory of the performative, highlights this. The crowd gathers because they want to see what will happen, but something has already happened and its energy, its magnetism is what draws them in. In the case of a bully's performatives or a former president's or a current governor's or a premier's, the assembled, a crowd, a gathering, join the bullying or share and or share in the shame of the target or both. Sedgwick singles out shame as the exemplary deformative, the shame on you that she argues haunts Austin I's, Austin's I do. But there are other examples of deformatives that shadow other approved and conventional convenings. For example, the performative We Hold, beloved by Arendt, which comes from the US Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that we hold houses a deformative, a not you, made plain by Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Those who are on the performative's bandwagon often don't want to hear about deformatives. They experience them as a kind of spoiler, ruining a pleasure they like to think was shared by all. For them, as in, say, the couple planning a wedding, the deformative is not an occasion for recognition or reassessment, oh, I didn't realize, but reason to demand their right to enjoyment. Stay away then, don't come, or come only if you can be happy for me. In the US and elsewhere, people, some of them theo-fascists, worry about the transmissibility of non-normative sexualities and genders as if queerness is something you can catch. Well, COVID is not. <laughs> For today, I want to distinguish three models of contagion by way of these three examples that I've mentioned. All three involve a contagious pleasure, release from work or punctual time, enjoyment of sexual liberation, emancipation, or transcendent experience, and all treat contagion as threatening, but also possibly generative, perhaps even necessary to democratic life and community. So first is the all at once model of contagion where a whole group of people is struck simultaneously and the example there is Euripides' Bacchae. 
The second model is the sequence model where a virus passes through a community one at a time, more or less, and in principle anyway, we could identify a patient zero who starts it all, and then a patient two and three and four sequentially. The third model is the threatened contagion that is contained, fenced off, controlled, lest it infect politics with its perverse pleasure. The response here is toleration in a liberal society, but it is also, in this case, as we'll see, a kind of subtle sequestration. My example, as I noted, is drawn from Rawls as a theory of justice. It's the example of the grass counter. He's just one paragraph in a 600-page book but he's key to everything. Long overdue, I would argue, for a queer reading in which I am aided. I will develop such a reading here, and I'll be aided by a comparison with the children's book, The Story of Ferdinand the Bull. The bull in that story will bring us back to Austin, but I'm not going to tell you how yet. Okay. In all three examples, techniques of absorption, performatively uttered, bring people back into a mainstream after they've experienced an outbreak of freedom for which they long. In the back eye in particular, that experience is collective. So let me start with the back eye. Does anyone know the story of the back eye? Anyone who is not familiar with the story of the back eye? Who is not familiar? I'm just trying to get you all to put your arms up because it's good for the oxygen. OK, OK. It's OK, I'll tell you. I think I can tell you most of what you need to know. In, my, in the book that Nadine mentioned that I published last year, A Feminist Theory of Refusal, I read the back eye as a drama of refusal, but the play is also about contagion. Indeed, the back eye's Dionysus, Dionysus is the god of wine, theater, and transgression, is arguably also a god of contagion. So this is, the play opens, I'm not gonna tell you the whole play because that would take too long and you should see it, but, um, but I'll tell you what you need to know. The play opens with Dionysus arriving in Thebes accompanied by a chorus of Asian bacchants. Soon after he arrives, the women of Thebes, the local women, refuse to be productive or reproductive, all of them, all at once. In response, the king of Thebes, Pentheus, jails the women who are refusing labor and work but they break out of that jail, or maybe Dionysus breaks them out. We can talk about that. Um, but I think they break out, and they have a kind of fever for freedom that leads them out of Thebes to go to a place called Cathiron outside the city where they idle, play, dance, rest, and worship outside the city where they live on water, wine, milk, and honey, which spring forth for them spontaneously um, without any effort or labor. These bacchants are... Oh, sorry, I messed that up. So they spend some time outside the city. They uh, do what Bacchants do. Um, and later, Agave, one of the leaders, and the women return to Thebes. Agave is actually the mother of King Pentheus. Um, later, Agave and the women return to Thebes, and Agave addresses the city, and she all but says, we are gathered here today. When she does so, let's see where we are. OK. Um, she calls first to the back eye of Asia, then to the men of Thebes, and only third to her father and son, as if to unify all of them performatively by way of her words and speech. But Agave's father, Cadmus, who's actually the founder of Thebes and the grandfather of Pentheus, resists Agave's effort with a series of performatives that I now think are really deformatives. He proceeds by recentering the couple and the corpse of the wedding and the funeral. The corpse, by now, is Pentheus, king of Thebes and son of Agave, who's now dead. He was killed by the women whose mysteries he tried illicitly to observe. And the couple are all the pairings of patriarchy, father, daughter, husband, wife, and mother, son, the sequence of a woman's life in Thebes. So this is the conversation that they have. And it starts with Cadmus saying to Agave, can you hear me? Like a lot of deformatives start that way. Can you hear what I'm saying? And then she says, I'm sorry, Father. I, I can't remember. What were we talking about? And a lot of deformatives are answered that way. Like, what? Into which house did you marry? I married Echion, one of the sown men, they say. And the name of the son you bore your husband? Our son is Pentheus. So he's trying to demagnetize the contagion of the women, which led this mother to participate in the killing of her son. Cadmus's questions move Agave through three male heads of household. Father, can you hear me? Husband, who'd you marry? And son. Um, and 
he is in effect saying in this way, we are gathered here today in order to undo the other gathering of the women, the all at once contagion with a kind of patriarchal partitioning. Each of the pairings is one in which a woman belongs to a man's household. Cadmus says to Agave in effect, you're a wife, you're a mother. These sound like constatives, they are. She is a wife, she is a mother. But these are also deformative utterances masquerading as constatives. And we know because the affect of agave after this uh, conversation is shame. These utterances, perhaps we should even call them utterances, say to agave, you have certain role as a woman. You are out of place. Get back in place. Agave's next speech act will mourn what she has lost. Ostensibly, she cries for Pentheus, her son, whom she's just realized she's killed. Sometimes it's like that. But her enforced, especially in tragedy, people often don't realize what they've done. Um, but her enforced maternity hides the other sorrow she also mourns, which is the lost recent freedom that Cadmus has now pronounced unpronounceable in the city. Now, that is the intended effect of Cadmus's theater of partitioning. Martha Nussbaum, who writes about this play as well, sees in this scene a return to moral reasoning for Agave, like she's been in the grip of the mysteries and now she's coming back to her senses. And, you know, I can't say that's not there, but I actually see it as Cadmus's effort to contain the contagion of freedom. The all at once model of contagion is met with separation and sequestration into individuated households, male headed in which women disappear into the private. He won't win, by the way, but this is his tactic, and it's the tactic of the city. If you want to find out what happens, you should go read the play, because I'm not going to tell you any more about it now. OK, the next uh, model of contagion comes to us from the fits, and it's the sequence model of contagion. Are there any questions so far, and can everyone hear me OK? Yeah? OK. Should have asked earlier. Sorry. Uh, okay, so The Fits is a 2015 film that offers a different model of contagion than the one in the back eye. The film depicts a contagion of sequence in which the Fits individuate those they land on. Different girls who experience them experience them variously. Some as a set of spasms, a loss of bodily control, some as an experience of quiet or transcendence. And because the Fits don't come all at once to the community but move through them, there's time in the interval for the girls that have yet to be visited by them to fear them, to pine for them, to wonder about them, to have all kinds of different relationships to the possibility that she may be visited by them. It's a temporality of anticipation, um, which is absent from the back eye. But like the back eye, in the end, so too in the fits, everyone is repatriated. The response of the city in the fits, as it were, um, will be to fit everyone into community, which is represented by a girls' dance troupe, whose theatricality is very absorbing. So does anyone know this film? Oh, good. Well, I won't spend a lot of time on it, and I have pictures, so it'll, that'll help. Um, so very briefly, here's what happens. The protagonist, Tony, is a young black girl in Ohio, positioned in a kind of genderqueer stage of adolescence. She's drawn both to the boys' gym in her local community center, where she boxes with her brother, and also to the girls' gym, where she watches the girls' dance troupe with seeming longing. When she boxes, Tony moves fluidly and easily memorizes the combinations when she's boxing. When she dances, she's awkward. She belongs comfortably to neither group. She moves back and forth between the sex-segregated spaces of the community center, and then the fits arrive. The experience of a sequential contagion moving through a community of girls and women is not, by the way, entirely fictional. In er interviews about the film, the director cites several reported occurrences in the US as inspirations for the story. In the film, the fits are depicted as contagion spa contagious spasms of involuntary movement that move through the ranks of the girls one by one. And as she watches, Tony is increasingly drawn to the girl side of the gym. She blends her boxing moves into dance, seeming to transition um, into that side of the gym. And, um, but it isn't until after she is visited by the Fitz that she is fitted into the girls' dance community. So for her, the Fitz seemed to be a kind of transitional experience. 
She's no doubt helped along to the right side of the sex gender binary by all the deformatives I won't list here, but I'll just say that in earlier scenes, the older girls mock her for her unfeminine physique and for her graceless moves in their gym. It's just how it is. But there's another contagion in the, at work in the film that hasn't yet been read as such, and that is the contagion of queerness. Most critics see in the film a transformative synthesis of Tony's conflicting parts, Certainly black social dance readings of the fit see a happy ending in which the film offers the social structure of dance to a community of generations long broken kinship suffered under slavery and in its wake. The para kinship reading of black social dance is supplemented by approaching the film as a maturation narrative, which a reading that is exemplified by Manola Dargis, who says in the New York Times, um, the title of the review is A Girl Who Follows Her Own Beat. And Dargis says, quote, Tony strives for belonging, awkwardly miming the moves of the older girls while studying their rights. In time, she also picks up their language. She pierces her ears. She wears nail polish. She flashes a smile. Um, all of this, Dargis sees as a perfect manifestation of adolescence. That's a quote from her again. It's all just a rite of passage. It's all perform performance through and through. And indeed, the film does cast Tony as a so-called tomboy, scripting her gender queerness as something she'll grow out of. From that perspective, the fits are valued because they land her on the right side of the sex-gender binary after a period of gender confusion. They quell Tony's queerness and offer a map of belonging. The proof of successful happy synthesis is in Tony's adherence to the steps of the dance. She finally masters the steps, and this unites her with all the girls at the end. Tony at the end is now costume compliant, no more sweats and hoodie, no more boxing paraphernalia, and her body is more pliant too. Is that teleology doing its work? Dargis seems to think so, but the film suggests otherwise, I, say, I think, when it plants a reservation, an imagistic objection to a naturalized or teleological reading of sex gender. Here, Tony is in the dance community. This is from the end of the, towards the end. Part of the troupe now, she cannot be found in that first image. You just can't make her out. She is fully absorbed. Moments later, the camera picks her out. But what we see, to me, is a rather disturbing close-up. Some sort of artifice has taken the place of Tony's earlier and remarkable authenticity. She now dresses the part she was born to play, that of a girl. But her femininity is so theatricalized that Tony either fully verifies Judith Butler's claim that drag is the secret truth of normalized sex gender identity as such, or Tony somehow is telegraphing a radical discomfort with it even as or even because she now belongs. I argue for both by smiling a smile of such artifice, Tony theatrically communicates a queerness unquelled, but perhaps rerouted. Her absorptive quiet has become as loud and spangly as her new dance outfit. Her, bod her body corporealizes the spangles with that smile. But the dance troupe's theatricalization of gender and Tony's prior experiments with nail polish and earrings, femininity's accoutrements, both insist on and also undo the naturalized sex gender binary, right? You have to work really hard to be a girl, so there's something unnatural about it as well. Meanwhile, the artifice of this image signals to us the deformativity of this belonging, which closes the door on Tony's waywardness while drawing nonetheless, I would argue, on her queer quiet as fuel to power the community. So the absorption isn't just an erasure, it's also a use of the person's energies, in this case queer energies, in a way that prevents them from being contagious but puts them to use because the, they help fire up the troop. This reading of the fits focused on the inextinguishable contagion of queerness and not just on that of the fits, rejects the perfectionism of the tomboy plot on behalf of what I would call imperfectionism, which rejects the maturation narrative, preferring to think in terms of false starts, reiterated, experimental, often shamed, sometimes celebrated, seems a more accurate account of adolescence to me. Okay, third example.
Rawls's A Theory of Justice also features a queer outlier who is contagious, an odd man who just wants to count blades of grass in a society in which all are urged to carve out rationally a life with, quote, a certain unity, a dominant theme, a project. Here's what Rawls says about the case. I didn't draw that, <laughs> but Helen de Cruz did. He says, imagine someone whose only ple I wish I had though. Imagine someone whose only pleasure is to count blades of grass in various geometrically shaped areas such as park squares and well-trimmed lawns. He's otherwise intelligent and actually possesses unusual skills since he manages to survive by solving difficult mathematical problems for a fee. The definition of the good forces us to admit that the good for this man is indeed counting blades of grass. That's because the de definition of the good is a liberal definition of the good where we just respect as long as you're not harming anybody, we respect your choices. So that's why the definition of the good um, is counting blades of grass. We're forced to admit that. Naturally, we should be surprised that such a person should exist. Perhaps he is peculiarly neurotic. But if we allow that his nature is to enjoy this activity and not any other, this establishes that it is good for him, and so we'll tolerate him. The point of the example which Rawls dreams up is to show how Rawlsian liberalism aims to be neutral among conceptions of the good. Although Justice's fairness is set up, the name of his place, his ideal place, um, is set up to support everyone in pursuing their conceptions of the good, it can also tolerate those who inexplicably choose not to be avid pursuers of a project. But note how Rawls here struggles with what to call this peculiar pastime. He first calls it a pleasure. He then calls it a good for him. And that is the base of, toler basis of tolerating it, that conversion of the pursuit from a pleasure to a good, a weird good, but still a good. It's not a pleasure anymore. So when Rawls says the definition of the good forces us to admit that the good for this man is indeed counting blades of grass, what that means is that the definition of the good forces this man to call his pleasure a good and not a pleasure. We can hear deformativity in Rawls's performative. Inside his reassuring it is a good for him lurks ongoingly a we're surprised such a person should exist. It's a sentiment of sequestration. Like Cadmus saying, go home to agave, by which he meant, we're surprised someone like you should exist, this one too, indeed all of these utterances are deformatives. They shame the outlier and they draw and consolidate the crowd. Alternatively, we should think of Rawls's expression of surprise. We could think of it as a reformative. That's my, I'm getting in the game of neologism here because everybody's doing it. Um, and that could be reformative, could be a, a, a word for utterances that seek to norm others. We're surprised to find that you exist, seems to qualify. Reformatives help to manage problems like Rawls's grass counter, who appears on city lawns like a family destroying back haunt, somehow stranded in the city after all the others have run off. Rawls's rhetorical reliance on the straight geometry of the city, those geometrically shaped areas, park squares, well-trimmed well lawns, well-trimmed lawns, just ooze straightness, and his conversion of pleasure into a good channel the Cadmian rejection of backism. Rawls's grass counter is what is left of pleasure in Justice's fairness, and Rawls tolerates it, but with his quarantining, straightening language, he also contains it lest it contaminate others. Importantly, it is a good for him is a deformative utterance that seeks to make it a good only for him. If this catches on, who's going to tend the farm, right? Rawls's happy grass counter calls to my mind the hero of the children's book, the story of Ferdinand, about a young bull who also indulges unusual pleasures and who is also genderqueer, like everyone I've discussed here today, the back haunts, Tony, and the grass counter. Unlike the other young bulls, Ferdinand likes to just sit quietly and smell the flowers in his favorite spot out in the pasture under a cork tree. Does anyone know this book? Okay. The ple everyone's position changes when you turn to a children's book. <laughs> it's like bedtime story. The pleasurable pastime is as useless as grass counting. 
But the question of tolerating Ferdinand does not arise. Other questions arise, though, when we realize, thanks to Ferdinand, that there is a bull also in J.L. Austin's How to Do Things with Words, which features a book-length running joke, in fact, about a bull in the field that may or may not be about to charge. The question is, as it were, is the bull of Ferdinand peaceful and pacified or a more wild sort of beast? The joke is on us since we cannot know, and the joke is on our speech acts because we can't say. But the joke also iteratively, and the iterative bull, I want to suggest, make the bull at least as iconic to Austen as the marrying couple centered by Sedgwick in her reading of How to Do Things with Words. Austen refers first in that text on page 33 to the undecidably constitutive and performative utterance, there is a bull in the field. Is it a descriptive statement or a performative warning? You can't tell just from the words, he says. Maybe the context would help. Maybe the, the way it's said would help. But you, the words themselves are undecidable. Later, just before returning to the bull, who may be about to charge, he says on page 55, Austin discusses the utterance, John is running. <laughs> then on page 62, we're treated to a memorandum from John, a kind of legalish document, uh, in which John Jones asserts that, quote, this bull is dangerous, which makes it in retrospect very funny that John was running just six pages earlier. Then later on page 98, John Austin turns to ponder the truth or falsity of a prediction like it is going to charge. Other mentions of warnings, several of them strewn throughout the book, also seem designed to trigger thoughts of the bull in the field. What if contra Sedgwick, we think not just of the I do as the iconically Austinian performative, but instead or also of there is a bull in the field who may be about to charge? What if we take that to be the iconic performative of Austin? It is the double of the I do since rather than convene a gathering, there's a bull in the field is more likely to disperse a crowd. Rather than install an I, there is a bull in the field sends the I running. Sedgwick is drawn by the I do to focus on Austin's straightening of pleasure, seemingly innocent of the shame it causes. But Austin's undecidable there is a bull in the field who may be about to charge suggests a possibly more radical openness to wayward pleasure than Sedgwick allows. There's a bull in the field is to me part Ferdinand, part Dionysus. Dionysus appears as a bull in the back eye. Um, Austin's bull, that is to suggest, is all pleasure and danger both. There's also a bull in the Hippolytus, which is another tragedy by Euripides. And this one I mentioned because Austin actually cites it on page 8 of How to Do Things with Words. I'm not going to give you a whole reading of the Hippolytus here, but I will say that in that play, the Hippolytus, the bull represents unchastened divine power and human mortality. Austin does not cite this scene in the play. He cites a different one, and I can't get into all the details here. Um, but I do want to just say that the quotation from the Hippolytus that Austin does use is important to Cavell's reading of Austin. But no one who comments on it notes either the bull in Austin nor in Euripides, and this matters, I think, especially since this bull in the Hippolytus is actually the agency by which it is said in the play Everything was mashed together. And it's also a play about queer desire in which a stepson and a stepmother desire each other, sort of. Um, so Eve Sedgwick criticizes Austin for prioritizing the idea of straight marriage as an exemplary performative. I'm suggesting here, though, that Austin is himself available for a queer reading by way of the bull. Sedgwick sets out to transform Austin for queer theory I see queerness as already there in Austin, which I think is a queer way to go. The bull thread in How to Do Things with Words, just so you can see the painting without my yellow circle, um, suggests an acknowledgment of the wild in Austin. And the thread does perhaps, um, and perhaps it serves, the thread does, as a performative illustration of pleasure or desire's contagion when it will simply not stay in its place, defying sequestration, reiterated again and again, like the bull is just not mentioned once, it just keeps coming back over and over again through the, through the text. Could we say, could we say that in place of the corpse and the couple of the performative utterance we are gathered, Austin 
actually offers up the bull, the warning, and the couple, the I doom. Might that pairing of bull and couple, warning and promise, sign memorandum and marriage contract, call attention to the power of desire in language and the limited effectiveness of sequestration, which seeks to isolate contamination from crowd. And often, as I've said, this happens by way of deformatives in the hope of preventing everything from being mashed together. But there's always a bull in the field in Austin, and he may be about to charge. So I have one last section. I have absolutely no idea how long I've been talking, although it should be 35 minutes, but I worry it's more. OK. because I start teaching, not just talking. OK, um, so this is the last section. And this is Austin towards the very end of his book, saying it's time to make a fresh start on the problem. Um, OK. So my point here is this. Austin offers a more wayward, less sovereign account of performativity than most of his readers see. And that includes Derrida, Cavell, Sedgwick, Butler, and others. I see affinities between the wild in Austin and the work by Patricia Williams done in the 1990s, especially in her book called The Alchemy of Race and Rights, where in a chapter called Word Bondage, she imagines a flight from the ordinary that is really quite remarkable. Williams recounts the impact on her. This is towards the beginning of the book. A contracts lawyer, that's what she was, um, and professor, she recounts the impact on her of finding out what may have, of finding what may have been the contract of sale for her great 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 grandmother, um, sold at age eleven and then possibly listed in a census at age thirteen with one infant. Williams too is focused, we can say, on the deformative, the sale of persons as objects by way of performative contracts, even then enshrined as the epitome of choice and freedom. We might think that it is in order to break the performative-deformative partnership that Sedgwick diagnoses that I've been exploring. It might be that it is in order to break that partnership that Williams herself takes a rather bacchic turn and makes the slightly mad case for treating rights as a contagion, an all-at-once contagion. And here's what she says. You see, the subtitle is Diary of a Law Professor, which is riffing on Diary of a Mad Housewife. So she's playing with madness. It's not me saying that. I don't think she's mad at all. I think she's quite brilliant. So here's what she says about rights. She says, we must give them away, unlock them from reification by giving them to slaves, give them to trees, give them to cows, give them to history, give them to rivers and rocks, give them to all of society's objects and untouchables, the right of privacy, integrity, and self-assertion. Give them distance and respect. Flood them with the animating spirit that rights mythology fires in this country's most oppressed psyches and wash away the shrouds. I know I'm giving you more than you have there, but this was so good. And wash away the shrouds of inanimate object status so that we may say not that we own gold, but that a luminous spirit owns us." Unquote. Astonishing and flimsy is Jean Elstein's characterization of this magical passage in her review of William's book in Salma Gundy back then. Conventional and not at all revolutionary is what other critics of Williams have said about her interest in rights. But neither asks what might become of rights if they underwent such an alchemy. What would they become if they were not a hoarded privilege or a castigated social error, but a virus indifferent to anyone? contagious and open to all, all at once. No schedule, no promise, no earning. I once read this passage in Williams, give them away to everybody and everything, as ironic as showing that white people would give rights to rocks before they would let them land on black people. But now these words of Williams are, far, are less far from serious than they were in 1992. I think they were quite serious then. I was like, wow. Now the idea of giving rights to rivers is a serious advance in law. And this passage of hers seems prophetic. But there's more here still to consider in the context of contagion. For these are rights released from their deep tether to the human, which means they're for everyone and everything, or that they can only be for everyone when they are for everything. And given the raced history of the human, such post-humanism might be just what is needed. 
This effort by Williams might seem not only prophetic, but also dated, because rights, some rivers do have rights now, are said to. Her flow of words that seeks to proliferate rights and level the structures of their legitimation in 1992 was emancipatory, especially in the context of then dominant debates about the possibility of resignification, rewording re as a reworlding. But now, today, the problem is often the floods of words, which empty the world like a biblical flood, and like that iconic flood, per prepare to repeople the world with couples, male and female, the pairings of reproduction and patriarchy. So I see Williams as here writing her way out of word bondage by way of a kind of virality. So in other words, there's that endless flow of words that seems to empty the world of meaning, but there's also the power of a kind of viral flow of words um, to reproduce something, to make something happen, but without the old styles of reproduction. Similarly, Hortense Spillers, 20 years after Patricia Williams, blesses the US Constitution with her claim that it was birthed by a virus which can only sustain itself, which is all viruses seek to do is to stay alive, stay alive the virus of constitutionalism can only sustain itself, Spiller says, by constant rotation, cutting women and all those abandoned by the founding documents onto the replicative stage, she says. She replaces the generationality of sequence with an all at once contagion too. And it's hard to tell, reading Spillers and Williams, whether the virus here is a promise or a warning. It is both. And in any case, the answer will depend on what gets assembled in its wake. Thank you. Thank you very much. Check. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bonnie. Uh, we now have time for questions and answers. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just come up here and I'll just invite questions right now. Michael, up. Hi, thanks very much for that great talk. Um, I think it um, is touching on a lot of things that are really important for us today as much as they were also when um, when you know the book I was being written, um, a question I have about that came to my mind wha about contagion and about speech acts was specifically about and particularly having to do with matters of like the public sphere and how we get along um, is lying. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to ask a specific question about lying in politics, how it's contagious, and not this sort of normal back in the day kind of lie, which was like, I have no recollection of the event in question or, you know, that, but like straight up, like there were a million people at my event and there weren't, you know, it was a, whenever I lose, it was a fake election. Like it, it's a kind of a different kind of lie. And normally, particularly, you know, at university, we have a phrase which we use, which is like, you can't say that. You can't say that because you, you know, it contradicts what you said, but we just say, you can't say that. But some people appear to have discovered that you can say it. You won't get hit by lightning if you just lie like that. Um, and famously, I think a lot of us are tried, we understand these things as specifically contagious. Um, and is there a special way in which they're contagious? Is there a, a category in Austin for this kind of um, utterance? Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you, it's a great question. I'm trying to think of what the neologism would be for the false formative or something. Um, so uh, so w w people working in political theory in the US have, and many others have of course been calling this the big lie, um, this kind of thing. These are all the big lie and the purpose of the big lie is actually to uh, decenter and displace the criterion of truth and falsity. Uh, well, it's interesting, actually. So it's, it, constative utterances are true or false. Performative utterances are powerful or weak, successful or unsuccessful, right? So if I say, this is a chair, <laughs> that's a constative utterance, and it's false, right? If I say, 
I'm chairing this meeting, I'm calling it to order, that's a performative, you can't say it's true or false really unless somehow I'm not chairing the meeting, but really what I've done is something that's either gonna succeed, everyone's gonna stop talking and listen to me, or not. But it's not a true or false statement. That's a key part of Austin's discussion of the distinction between constitutive and, and performative. And until he, he made that distinction, a lot of linguistic philosophy was premised on how every speech act could be converted into a descriptive one about which we could say whether it's true or false. And so the reason Austin is still important now is he's the one, he's not quite the only one, Wittgenstein was doing a version of this as well, but he's the one who came in and said, that's just what you guys think is everything, that's just one class. There's actually this other class of utterances and we don't think of them as true or false. We have to really violently reconfigure them so that they are no longer themselves. Like, I promise could be, you know, Professor Honig promised, you know, and now it's true or false. But that's not what happened when I said I promise. Something else happened, right? So what I'm thinking for the first time in response to your question is that what the big lie does is it takes a larger class of things out of the domain of the true or false constative. My crowd was so big is not about whether in that way of speaking is not about whether the crowd was big. It's about whether you're going to follow me. It's about whether you won't care that there are pictures of a small crowd. So it's a performative that is a way of saying, because many performatives are better said indirectly rather than directly. So instead of saying we are gathered here today, I go, hi, everybody. But I just said, right, it's the same function. So instead of saying, Will you follow me even though I'm going to take you down this horrible path of possibly genocidal politics? You say, my crowd was big. And if everyone in says, yeah, it was big, then they have said they will follow you out of the domain of truth and into this other domain. So just like Austin took philosophy of language and sliced it up and said, well, there's a class of sentences of utterances that don't fit what you guys are saying. They're not descriptive. They're not true or false. There's a way in which that's getting like reversed and everything is being made performative, right? That's not to say obviously that it's okay because everyone got very excited about Austin on performatives because it was freeing. Like suddenly we could talk about in philosophy of language in a way that matched up with how we think we talk, right? It's called how to do things with words. Well, we know we do it all the time. <laughs> and now we have a philosophical account of what it is we're doing when we do that. That was exciting at the time. And I think it still is for a lot of people, but it's not exciting to see the whole, do the whole domain of the constative undone so that everything is performative now. And there were arguments, especially on the post-structuralist side of the philosophy of language about how, well, once one thing, like Derrida's reading of Austin was, well, once you have a class of things called performative, they infect everything. Even your constatives are performative. Like, so he was doing the opposite move, right? And that was an interesting argument to have around questions of language and meaning. But in the political domain, what's, what I would say in response to that is you don't need a new word. What you need, what Austin helps you with is how to track how the whole orientation providing set of utterances that are constatives have been taken over by a kind of fact-free, because it's supposed to be fact-free, performativity. But the real thing that's happening in those performativities has nothing to do with crowd size. It has to do with loyalty. And it also has to do with inching people away little bit by little bit. How many people were at the inauguration? How many did you see this? Is Alabama here or here on the map? You know, like inching people away from feeling like they have a check in relationship to you and, and instead feeling like they, all they have is a relationship to you from which there's no check, right? So that's, I think, that's one way to think about that game. It's a really dangerous game. It's a world-destroying game. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We're just trying to like simultaneously work out if there's other people who always also have their hands up. Um, hi, I, I love what you just said, but I, it was, um, I just wanted to make ask a question that would help me clarify what I understand to be your project. Because it seemed to me, as the project went on, it seemed to me that you were, um, you said at the beginning a joke like, I'm not sure about the half and a half. And I wondered if by the end you kind of were, 
because uh, it seemed you were more inclined to see um, performatives and deformatives in a lot of constitutive statements, like John is running could yes. <laughs> exclude those of us who know we should run <laughs> and <laughs> never will. Um, uh, so, I mean, it sounds like you're kind of trucking to like every, every constitutive, even a mild one like John is running can be yeah. this other thing. So I wondered if like maybe you were even more Austinian than I thought you were, because you're going to say something like um, what Austin would say that it's not that this statement's one and not the other, it's off in context, right? So the door is closed, could be an accusation or just a report. Right. Um, so how, how much, how far away from Austin's project do you want to go? Because I want to burrow really deeply into Austin's oh, project. That's okay, I think that I think I'm getting it now. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, in that way, that's what I meant when I said I thought that Austin was queerer to begin with than Sedgwick gave him credit for. She came in and gave this sort of queer reading of Austin, which was critical of him for his conventionalism. Uh, and there's plenty to discuss there if one wants to, but I'm saying, you know, if you read the I do without the bull, if you read the couple without the crowd, if you see the I and you never see its dispersal, then Austin looks very conventional. That conventional Austin that she criticizes, and Derrida does too, although he also sees some other radicalities in Austin that others don't, it has another side. So for people like Stanley Cavell, that conventionalism is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's not that it's like an anti-queer position per se, but he loves the conventionalism of ordinary language philosophy. He thinks that it holds the basis of a possibility of grounded experience, the rough ground of experience, he calls it. So it's not that he's in love with thoughtless conventionalism or even with prejudice or anything like that, but he thinks there's something rich in conventionalism that others like Sedgwick and Derrida don't. And I think I'm somewhere, you know, in the agon with these guys saying, actually, there, where's the bull? You know, there's this bull in Austin, and it's a creature that represents desire in every Shakespeare play. So why aren't we, what happens if we think about this as the icon? Like, you're picking one, you know? And one of the things Sedgwick says is, which I love the Sedgwick reading, I think that should be obvious. I'm doing uh, two things. One is, I'm arguing back that there's more of a queer theory Austin than she thought, partly by saying she makes a joke in her article about Austin that um, what Austin shows is that you can say the words I do a billion times and still not be married. <laughs> he, says, he says the words a billion times in the book. Um, but he doesn't say them a billion times. I haven't counted, but it's like six, seven, eight, or nine, or ten. So if it's how many times, then there's that many mentions of the bull too, right? So then it's a question of like, well, why the one and not the other? Um, but it's also the case that I think that her idea of deformatives was brilliant. I think it's a great idea to think about particular acts that stigmatize and shame and, um, and divide and, um, rather than performatives, which tend to be happier. I mean, he has some that are about insulting or whatever, but there's not that many of those. Most of them tend to be uh, more positive sounding options. What I think Sedgwick doesn't do, partly because she just left it, she came up with this, you know, everybody does this, I guess, she came up with this great idea and just left it, moved on to the next thing. Um, what she doesn't do is think about whether it's possible that all performatives harbor a deformative. Some of them are more obvious, shame on you, or, you know, uh, others like that, can you do this, you know, that sort of thing, um, are sort of more obviously working as deformatives, but that's why I brought in that Frederick Douglass example just so quickly to say, you know, here's the we hold, it harbors a deformative, but its performative power depends on you either not knowing that or acting like you don't know that. Like that great we hold is only great if you're not paying attention to its deformative. So then that make, makes us start to think or invites us to start to think about how how and where our most powerful inaugural democratic possibilities, which are important to us because they're contagious, because they draw people in, also have a sort of constitutive power of excluding some, that their contagion may even depend on the fact that some are deformed by them, and how to think about how you can have like the power of the contagion uh, without or while addressing at least the deformative blowback of that performative. So 
Um, so that's not a fully systematized way of saying it, but the idea is take Sedgwick's insight and ask it about all performativity as such, and then see where we can go with that. Um, but now I'm also going to think about how all constitutives are deformatives too, <laughs> or have become so. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. And um, I really enjoy this and forgive the, such a simple question, but does the mode of conveyance affect this at all? So I noticed that your two major examples are plays, which are meant to be watched and heard. Now, of course, one's a play that has been turned into a movie, and we, you know, thousands of years later, but they're both, at their essence, they're meant to be watched and heard. So is contagion most effective? And, and this is, I guess, a question of reception. I'm not sure if it's answerable, but is contagion most effective in oralities? And it is performative and even deformative, uh, so, you know, is that is that something really that playwrights and people who mean to have their work seen and heard in a different way play upon in the structure of their arguments? Thank you. These have all been really great questions. Um, I mean, it's odd, right, because the play has a script, so it's not oral, it's written, then it's performed. Um, the we hold of the declaration, which is called a declaration as if it's oral, was circulated in print, um, print many copies printed off and circulated all around. Um, so um, so it's, hard, it's hard to go back, in a way, to the print oral distinction, to the written you know, oral distinction, and call either one or the other. It is true, as you point out, um, that I used a play and then a film and then a canonical political theory text. Um, a dramatic moment in a, in a canonical political theory text. Um, but I don't know, but like theater and film and theory, I think that the best way to convey an argument is through the exemplary and the lifelike. So like I could have given you all of this without the three examples. I don't think it would have been as much fun. Um, and there still would have been some examples. I still would have said things like shame on you, which would have conjured a scene in your mind, but wouldn't necessarily have been the same one as in my mind or in their minds. And so when we have a shared text that we can look at together, we have a, a common object um, that allows us to uh, have a common conversation, to know that we're having a common conversation. Of course, we all interpret it differently, but we still have something that around which we're oriented or by which we're oriented. So, um, so I don't think, so have I missed something though? Because I feel like the mode of conveyance was trying to say something to me that maybe I've missed in responding this way. Did I miss something? So you're sig you're asking if an oral communication is less is more contagious because we're all in the room together and I make a joke and everybody laughs and that titter sort of travels through the crowd or, um, than a written one and I'm not sure that that can I'm not sure I agree with that although I can certainly understand I mean there's liveness in a moment of liveness you can feel the contagion you know where everyone's at a play, everyone's suddenly afraid, you hear everyone go, <gasps> you know, when something's about to happen, and you realize like you're having some kind of shared experience, and some people who weren't paying attention realize from everybody else's <gasps> that they should be scared, and then they are too, and that's part of the contagion effect as well of live theater. Um, and you're right to think that there's some sort of connection of some kind between performance and performative, although it isn't, uh, you know, a, a flat one of just all performativity is performance, but there are connections there. And they have to do with the most ritualized performatives being theatrical. Nobody says we're gathered here today. You know, they say we are gathered here today. You know, there's a body comportment that goes with that, and it's theatricalized. So you're right to see all of that. But on the other hand, 
you know, we were just talking about Benedict Anderson's book, Imagine Communities at Dinner, so I'll just mention that one as an example. A lot of community contagion happens through the circulation of written text. The fact that we all read the same newspaper, or once upon a time we did just 30 years ago, read the same newspaper every morning, you know, created a kind of sense of shared community. You know, if you think of the old pictures of men commuting to work, all reading the same newspaper on the train or whatever, you know, that's um, a, a, a kind of example that gets conjured by, uh, by Anderson, and that's, uh, the circulation of print is itself the basis of a contagion. So I can't quite yield on that. I can say maybe that it's interesting to think about the differences and commonalities between the different ways in which contagion happens. And we could say affect travels through a crowd that's live and gathered. And that would be more in line with maybe what Judith Butler is talking about in a performative theory of assembly in her book, in their book by that title, where it's a question of like how the crowd comes to share certain kinds of things because they've been in the square for a week now and you know they get more and more united as they go. Um, but it's not just liveness that does that. I mean, if you think about how crowds gather through social media, you know it's not just liveness that does that, that there's contagion that happens there. So it'll be interesting to sort of parse it out more. I think it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Well, thank you for this wonderful talk. It provoked a lot of things in, in my mind. I was going to ask you about um, your choice of roles in the list of those three performatives, because the first two, this, the, the separation and the, and the isolation, the second one, it's easy to see the, the formative nature of the performative in, in those. But the roles, of course, in the first look, it looks like an odd choice because the whole theory of justice is actually built itself on, on being the true performative, the tolerance looks like it doesn't really actually fit there, mm -hmm. but I find it actually refreshing. It's almost sort of a corrective to a, a liberal theory of justice is that what's actually hidden behind in that performative tolerance is the deformative nature of it. So I just was wondering if you could say a little bit more on that. Sure, thank you. I, you've, you've guessed my point, uh, which is that it's a very admirable liberal theory of justice. And really, I would kill to go live in that place right now. So I mean, we shouldn't overstress the criticisms. It looks awfully good, doesn't it, right now, where there's public deliberation and you have to give an account of yourself and people support your projects. Um, but even a lovely project like that has what I call remainders. Um, and those aren't like incidental people who happen not to fit. Their ill-fittedness is produced by even the best instances of the project. So this is the way in which a wonderful performative has a deformative. The wonderful performative is, this is not just a liberal leave them alone and everybody do their own thing society. This is a state is doing a lot to create possibilities for everyone to achieve their you know, aspirations and to develop their projects and the rest in ways that you know, maximize or fulfill their abilities. And uh, it's a very supportive and uh, uh, you know, uh, well-meaning environment, right? And even there, the performative of, you know, the veil of ignorance, which is like, I will this version, not that version of the difference principle, the, that performative generates, maybe he's peculiarly neurotic. What do you think? What should we do about him? He doesn't seem to be enjoying. He, we want him to be enjoying everything we're enjoying. And that's why I love pairing him with Ferdinand, because Ferdinand's mom is just like, Okay, if you, do you want to go play with other bulls? No, you don't want to? Okay, you know, smell the flowers. She's not like, are you gay? <laughs> She's not like, it's, you know, you should toughen up, you know? It's not going to be easy for you to live like this. She didn't say any of those things. She didn't say, are you neuro neurotic? She's just like, okay, that's for now. This is who, for, she meets him where he is. And Rawls presents the liberal society of theory of justice as one that will meet you where you are, as long as you don't violate you know, the fundamentals. And, um, and I think that's true. But it doesn't meet everyone where they are in exactly the same way. Um, and you can see, I mean, this is 
a philosopher who went to the trouble of dreaming up this example so that he could show, vindicate, how tolerant his society was going to be. Like, it both wants the best out of you, but it will totally tolerate you if you're a low-achieving kind of loser guy. Like, you know, totally tolerate you. And that's the point of that example. But what's in the example, which I love, because, you know, I love it's so great when something repays attention to the details, right? It starts out as his only pleasure is this. So there's nothing else. We, wouldn't you rather do that? Nope. He only has this pleasure. Nothing else will, right? And then, OK, it's a good for him, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, OK, it's a good. It's his good. And, you know, and so there's this sense of, I wish it were otherwise. He may be neurotic. Well, he probably isn't. You know, we don't have any grounds for intervention. He's not mad. And most importantly, he has a job. He doesn't have a job. He's kind of a gig economy guy, right? Because he solves difficult mathematical problems for a fee. So like in 1970, Rawls was already imagining what you know the gig life would look like. And here it is. And so it all works out pretty well when you compare it to many other versions of the story. And nonetheless, there's, a re there's something remaindered here. And in a different society, which might be worse at some things and better at others, you know, you might look at a guy like that and walk by, not because out of a mean indifference, but just because there's a lot of different people who live here and people are into all kinds of things, you know? Um, and uh, others might join him and you wouldn't worry about it because there's plenty of room in the world for grass counters. You know, and uh, and you wouldn't think it was your business to judge him either. So, you know, in my first book, I argued that the problem with the grass counter wasn't obviously with the grass counter, but it it was generated by Rawls's commitment to justification. Like, if everything has to be justified all the way down, because otherwise it doesn't pass the deliberations test or the philosophy's test that it can justify the rules by which we live, then you end up with people who think justification is good. And they go around asking people to justify themselves. And then you're not living in exactly the place, right? So like the foundation of justification that philosophy brings to politics ends up bleeding into the practice or the experienced experience of the regime, right? Um, but now, I, now that was my first round with it. And all three examples, by the way, are, as I said at the very beginning, things that I've read differently in the past. And now through the lens of contagion, I see them in this new way. And I hadn't before read The Grass Counter as a queer figure, by which I mean he doesn't fit established conventional categories of acceptable existence. And that because the metaphors in that paragraph are so full of straightness, I just don't understand why he only counts well-trimmed grass. Like, that seems like a way that Rawls has of saying he's all about pleasure, but not too much, you know, because it's well-trimmed, so it's worrying, but not too worrying. Makes you wonder, right? What's, what if he was counting wild grass? Would we also tolerate him? Like, the implication is maybe that would be more worrying. So there's just something, you know, I want to say anxious about the prose of the example, which I think betrays an awareness of how justification can bleed into everything and not just provide a defensible foundation. Does that answer your question? Uh, it's a quick question. Uh, thanks for uh, such an excellent talk. Um, in the movie The Fits, this, it, it, would you say there's this kind of sliding scale between the young girl's emulation at the start of her peers, you know, she, she wants to box, um, and she wants to dance like the older girls. So that's a, and then that leads into the bad viral contagion. But is, is mm -hmm. emulation already a kind of contagion? Or is, is there some relation between those, um, the sort of benign or not too violent emulation and the, and the contagion of the fits? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen the film, uh, it's as, you know, and for anyone who doesn't know any 12 or 13 year olds in their life, I mean, we all know at least one um, ourselves at that age. So um, there's a, a desire to belong that leads this, you know, odd duck of a girl to be really observing. She's a little sister also. So I think of this as like little sister mentality where nobody tells you anything because the household is busy. So you get used to sort of keeping track of every little bit of 
you know, dust of information that gets dropped unwittingly in front of you. You keep track of everything. So she's, uh, she doesn't, she's at an awkward stage where she is really beautifully and well cared for by her older brother who boxes. And so that's a natural sort of affinity that she has given her circumstances. And then she's drawn also um, to the girls' gym. And a lot of the um, belonging takes place through a kind of mimicry, sort of contagion. As I said, it could be even seen as a kind of drag performance of um, sex gender, uh, where there's a lot of copying and citational behavior. Um, and so that could look like, you can read that as a kind of first contagion and then the second contagion of the fits um, is either like a meta expression of that or, uh, you know, the wind that blows through the community that stops the citationality of the nail polish, the earrings, the clothes, and just finalizes it, stamps her finally into the thing. And that's why like the whole reading that I have, which is, you know, it's a reading, um, and as I showed you with Dargis, there are other ones, is that really odd, it's just stated, I love the film, it's an amazing film, I really recommend everyone should see it, it's just an incredible film. Um, what struck me was the was the artifice of her smile at the end, where she's been just an incredibly genuine presence on screen in many different moods, but always genuine. And then at the end, she's in the Spangles, and it's like, and you know, and I was like, is she a bad actress? <laughs> you know, like was the rest sort of more naturally who she was, and now she has to be a different, and that doesn't seem right. I mean, she's an amazing actress, so that can't be right. So although she was a new actress when she did the film, she wasn't an actress when they found her, so it was possible, but I didn't think that was right. And I thought, you know, maybe it is, as I said, either evidence of the artifice of the belonging, like the nail polish and the earrings, now the smile is another effort to belong, and it's working better you know, than the prior ones, partly because of the contagion of the fits, in which case they're compatible. The mimicry, which is the first contagion, is compatible with the second one. And I don't dispute that. I just think that the artifice of that smile, I feel like it's like, I don't know, to me it just felt like a message to me. Like, it's not what you think. They have me for now, you know? And, and I'm really aware and mindful of the fact that the black social dance readings see this film as a kind of repair of the broken kinship history of um, black broken family structures since slavery. And I want to be um, sort of uh, affirming of that reading and also affirming of the remaindering, again, even there, just like with the Rawls, you know, great liberal society, it's got a remainder right here. Um, I want to, I feel like the, that the artifice of that smile is saying, I belong. It's good. I've had a transcendent experience. This is, uh, you know, um, a community that will hold me and love me. I may not be the girl they think I am. It's just a little something. Um, and that, and, you know, and then the only question is, do we read that as a worrisome contagion to the community? Or do we read that as something that will be accepted? Like, is she a grass counter to this community the way, right? So that's the question that remains for me. But it only comes out of the artifice of that smile at the end. I mean, I just found her so completely lovable <laughs> all the way through the film. And then there was this, um, and it feels so forced. And I thought, the director could have got 100 other smiles out of her, like, that's the one. It just feels like there's something left for the sequel there, you know? Maybe sequels are another contaminant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're coming to the close of a wonderful evening, such a thought-provoking talk and a new way of reading um, uh, our, our, democratic, uh, our democratic landscape. So I want to thank you. And I believe right now there's going to be a presentation. Yes. <laughs> Yes, Jasmine Rain. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I'm just going to put my uh, little guy back here. Is everybody sitting? Sorry, I really thought he was going to.
thing on fire? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> on behalf of Trent University, I'd like to thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today, Dr. Hyde. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's so beautiful.